This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. So let's look at verse 1. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So the first day of the week is Sunday. And this is why most Christians meet on Sunday and not on the Sabbath day. The disciples also met on Sunday. Because if you look at the book of Acts in chapter 20 and verse 7, it says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So they got together on the first day of the week, to break bread, Paul preached, and he preached until midnight. That was on a Sunday. Now, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So here, Paul is talking about giving. And this is a controversial subject. But 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So the more you give, the better you're going to come out. And I, I don't limit this to money. You can give without giving money. And most people around you here in America don't even need your money. They just want your money. Or they're too lazy to get a job, so they only need it because they don't want to work. The specific collection here in 1 Corinthians 16, is for the poor saints. And you can give in a number of ways. So I don't limit this to money. And many times you can give money when it's not needed. You can give money and it actually hurts the person who receives the money. For example, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. I've seen men stand on the street next to Walmart holding up signs for money and food, yet they had their shirt off and their biceps was bigger than their head. And I'm thinking, they can't get a job, these able-bodied men? Can't they go get a job and work just like I have to work? Sometimes you can further someone's deadbeatedness by giving them money. I'm sure there are people on the street that, that really do need money, and really have issues while they can't work and things like that. But the average bum on the street is saying, I'm going to have you go to work and then I'm going to stand out here and I'm just going to let you give me your money. You can give them a Bible, you can give them a tract, give them a second of your time to show them the gospel. But men need to work. And a lot of times you're giving people money, they're going to go use it on drugs, they're going to use it on alcohol. But 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So what's some good rules on giving? Give as you purpose in your own heart. Don't do it grudgingly. Don't do it of necessity. Do it cheerfully. So pretty much you want to love to give. If you love someone, then you'll love giving them something. And once again, I'm not limiting this to money. Too much today, men have money on the brain. And they have so much money that they look for ways to spend it. They're just looking for a way to spend it. Uh, Christianity, as we see it today, can be a money-making machine. All the big dogs have a million and one ways you can donate to them and by the looks of their clothes, their church building, their way of life, on top of all the money that they have coming in from the congregation, they really don't need as much as is being sent in from people donating across the country. It comes to a point where you sit back and say, how much money do you need? And it also gives people the idea that to do something for God, you need to have a bunch of money which is completely not true. You don't need a bunch of money to do something for God. I can get up every day and do something for God with just the money I have, or even if I didn't have money, I could still do something for God. 
it also gives people the idea when you're always constantly asking for money that Christianity is about making a living. They see a man wearing a nice suit and he's got a, a beautiful trophy wife. He travels around the nation in some big tour bus, eats at nice restaurants, sets up in the best motels, has a red carpet laid out for him at the church when he gets there. You see the services in these beautiful buildings. When people watch it online, they see these beautiful buildings. They see that everything is, is perfect. It You can't smell it, but it's almost like it smells good. It gives people the idea that they can be some type of Christian celebrity. But when you read the Bible, you get a completely different picture of the men God uses. And while what I do on this little no-name internet ministry isn't much. I've been doing it for years. I've never asked for money or had any money donated. It's going along just fine. I don't need anyone's money to continue doing what I'm doing on here. And obviously, it's not some big, big thing like a lot of these people have. But I mean, it shows that you don't need money to continue doing something for God. I know most people wouldn't consider this a ministry. I guess they think the people who watch aren't really people. But the difference in these lessons on here and lessons I teach at church or something is that people are voluntarily using their free time to get on to here to listen to these. Whereas when I teach at church, people may just be coming because going to church is a tradition for them or something, something that they've always done. And they may or may not really care about what I have to say. So I consider the lessons I put on here just as important, if not more important. Because people are actually getting on their computer, seeking out to hear the Bible taught and listening to these lessons. And no money is required. You can do plenty of work for God absolutely free. You may have to have a full-time job to pay for gas, a vehicle and the internet, and things like that, but most people have that already anyway. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pay your pastor or preacher. I'm not saying you shouldn't give. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 9, 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So if you have a pastor or something, you need to pay him. I don't think it's wrong for people to give their past to their pastor. However, much money they want to give. However, how much money you want to give or how much ever you want to give to take care of him, buying him a car or whatever else, that's your business. I'm just weary of preachers who go around basically begging for money and have so many donate buttons on everything they have on their website and their whole ministry, they emphasize giving to their ministry. You go to their website, there's a big donate button, a big PayPal button. And just constantly talking about, please donate, please donate. I'm thinking, how much money do you need, man? You have to admit that turns off a lost man quicker than just about anything. They got it where your your uh, ties is taken out of your debit card, and it's just that's all they talk about. And you know, I hear lost men all the time talking about how that's all preachers talk about today is money, money, money. And it's true; it's getting to that point. Where that's all they'll talk about is tithing and money. But First Corinthians 16, 3, it says, And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So Paul and the, and the person the Corinthians approve is going to take the money of the things that they're given that they have collected to the, for the poor saints at Jerusalem. And then in 2 Corinthians 9, the giving was referring to giving for the ministry, which is a good thing to do. I'm not against it. I'm just against people abusing it, which they do. Verses 4 through 8 is Paul referring to his traveling on his missionary journey. And he, he was going to stay with the Corinthians for the winter. In verse 4 it says, Now if I be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you, and when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit, 
but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. So this is a door. This door is an opportunity. As it talks about in Revelation 3, 8, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. So Paul has an open door, but there are many adversaries. God may give you an open door, but don't expect for there not to be somebody on the other side ready to kick you down. As it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I believe Paul's thorn in the flesh were other people trying to mess him up. These people were under the influence of the adversary, under the influence of the principalities and powers, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, 1 Corinthians 16, 10. Now, if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. So, notice Paul recommends other preachers besides himself. Watch out for preachers who won't recommend anyone else but themselves or the men around them that are just clones of them. Always watch out for that. 1 Corinthians 16, 11 through 13. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. Watch ye, stand in the fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. So Paul teaches a man should be a man, not a sissy, not a man that dresses up like a woman, not a woman that doesn't know which bathroom to go in, not a man that wants to marry another man. He says, quit you like men, be strong. An attribute of a man is that he is strong, not just physically, but spiritually. Verse 14, let all your things be done with charity. This because charity edifieth when nothing else will. If you have charity, then you show love and care to other Christians. Verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Today, addicted is a big word. Many people have a drug addiction. Families are ruined because of addiction. Many men have pornography addiction that ruins a marriage. Some, um, some people ask the question, how do I get my husband to stop looking at so much pornography? And uh, this marriage counselor said, well, ladies, if you think that you have a husband that doesn't watch porn in these days, then you're mistaken. But that's nonsense. Sure, there are probably more men with this addiction than there isn't. But there are Christian men who have made a covenant with their eyes that don't let, that don't let the, something affect them so much that they have to go watch that junk. And, and, but when people talk like this, it gives people the idea that sin is unbeatable. That's basically what that so-called marriage counselor was doing, was making that sin look unbeatable or that you couldn't get victory over that sin or alcohol or drugs or any other sin. All these sins are something you can get victory over. But that addiction, it's a big word. Many people have addictions today. Kids are addicted to video games. There's men addicted to video games. And that's not something that you can't get victory over. Uh, women are addicted to TV shows many times and things like that. But Paul says the house of Stephanus has addicted themselves to the ministry. And addictions aren't wrong as long as you are addicted to the right things. I'm addicted to reading the Bible. I'm addicted to studying the Bible. There are times that something may happen and cause me to lose some time reading my Bible and studying my Bible. This can lead me to getting irritable or just wanting to pull away from the responsibility at hand to get the Word in. And when you have an addiction, you have a craving. Do you crave the Lord at work? Do you crave the Bible at work? Many people can't even focus on the job or work because they're worried about getting a cigarette or to go dip. You should feel that way about the Bible. 
1 Corinthians 16, 16 and 17, that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. Notice all the people that Paul recommends. This because Paul isn't just a one-man show. He has friends, he has people that he fellowships with and believes are good people as well. He doesn't believe that he is the only Christian in the whole world. Verse 18, For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Have you ever met another Christian who would refresh your spirit? When I get around people who love the Bible and love God, it can refresh my spirit. Many times your phone starts being slow or your computer starts being slow. You can refresh the page or restart the program and it makes things a lot faster. That's what it's like being around someone who is charged up on the Bible. They can refresh your spirit. I love getting around somebody who loves to talk about the Bible and is willing to talk about the Bible. Because most people won't. Most people don't want to talk about it. They think that you're trying to depress them if you mention the Bible or something. Or they think it's sweet that you just, they come in, they see you reading the Bible because, you know, they don't see that and they don't read the Bible themselves. They don't know what's in the Bible. They think the Bible is just a book of devotions. They don't realize what's in it. Somebody that stays in the Bible can refresh you. Paul says, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So notice there is nothing wrong with house churches. Uh, it says in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. You'll see over and over where Paul refers to the church in thy house. The building doesn't make the church. All born-again believers make up the church. And born-again believers meeting together in their area, maybe in a building, makes a local church. The size and building does not matter. And I think people have figured that out more, seeing with all this stuff going on right now with the, the quarantine stuff. They've come more open to that idea that you don't have to be in a big flashy building to have a church. If you have a pastor in your congregation, all born again believers there together, all the people that see the church is made up of all born again believers, then you have local churches scattered around everywhere. But there's nothing wrong with a house church. First Corinthians sixteen twenty, all the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. Today, and in our society here, we do this with a handshake. As Paul also did do handshakes, as you read about in Galatians. But if you go up to a man's wife and greet her with a kiss, her husband may knock your head off. Or if you go greet another dude with an holy kiss, in wicked sodomite America, they may think you are LGBT. But in Galatians 2, 9, Peter and John give Paul the right hands of fellowship. So I just stick with the right hand of fellowship. And now you can't even do that because people are afraid to shake your hand, which I understand. So just wave at somebody or something. But 1 Corinthians 16, 21 says the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. So Paul wrote the salutation. He put his signature to show that this epistle or a letter was truly from him verse 22 if any man love not the lord jesus christ let him be ana anathema maranatha so this means cursed at his coming so do you love the lord or yourself more it says if any man love not the lord jesus christ and it says in second timothy 3 1 through 2 this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. See that lovers of their own selves. Do you love yourself or the Lord more? 
Verse 23 in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So we had to have the grace of God to be saved, for by grace he is saved through faith. But we also need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we need grace for every situation, for every day. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve, whereas mercy is God keeping you from something that you do deserve. You didn't just need them at salvation. You need them for every situation. Verse 24. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. The first epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi by Stephanus and Fortunatus, Nicaechus and Timotheus. So Paul loved the Corinthians more than they loved him. And he says in 2 Corinthians twelve fifteen, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So you need to love your converts and followers more than they love you. Don't expect them to cater to you. Esteem them better than yourself. Don't give up on them, even though they may give up on you, like they did with Paul sometimes. So you see, Paul was blinded by the light of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and he got his sight back in Acts 9.18, so he still has a little bit of bad eyesight. Paul physically wrote Galatians, with his own hand, but 1 Corinthians, for example, and the others were written by someone else as he told them what to write. And that's why Second Peter one twenty one says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So just because Paul didn't actually write it with his own hand, all of it, he spake it as he was moved by the Holy Ghost and someone else wrote it down. And now it's preserved throughout time all the way to today. It was inspired and it's preserved for us. But this has been 1 Corinthians chapter 16.